Our scripture today comes from the ninth chapter of Hebrews, beginning at the 24th verse. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy of holies every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once and for all, the culmination of the ages, to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once, and after that face judgment, so Christ has sacrificed once, to take away the sins of everyone, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting on him. Amen. Amen. Do you like to watch those cooking shows? Um, that come on TV from time to time. I remember Julia Childs uh, mastering the art of French cooking. Uh, it was an interesting show, and she had everything at her fingertips that she needed to be a really good cook. There were always two ovens available, and everything that could be that could measure, and everything that could be an ingredient and all the stuff that she needed, the bowls, the plates, the platters, whatever she needed was all at hand, right there. Same way with uh, Rachel Ray, her cooking show, and the British baking show, here again. Baking chefs uh, from all over Great Britain gathering together, and everything they need is at their fingertips. It's hard not to be a good cook in that environment. Um, they had all that was necessary. And that's the way it is for our salvation. And that's what Hebrews 9 is about. Remember Abraham and Isaiah? Abraham who had waited so long for his son, and then there's his son, and he's asked to go out and sacrifice his son. And do you remember that as they traveled up the mountain, uh, young Isaiah would ask, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham had a powerful answer. God will provide. And that's what, it, that's what happened. As they got to the place uh, for the Sacrifice on the top of the mountain, they built an altar, and just as Abraham was about to uh, sacrifice his own son, there appeared to be a ram in the uh, bramble with his horns uh, all tied up in, the, in this bush, and they took that uh, ram and sacrificed it. Isaiah did not need to be sacrificed. God provided the sacrifice. God provided what Abraham needed at the proper time in the proper place. Same way with uh, Isaiah and the burning coal. Remember in the sixth chapter, Isaiah is uh, in this magnificent, magnificent um, sanctuary and an altar. And he is... Uh, in the presence of cherubim, angels, and he is made aware of his sinfulness, and he is made aware of his uncleanness, if he would. And that's what
what he said. I am an unclean uh, man among unclean people. And the, uh, at the God's beck and command, the angel takes a coal from the fire, touches it to Isaiah's lips, and said, your sins are atoned for. Your sins are forgiven. Again, God provided the remedy for Isaiah's sin. God provided it. It's not something that Isaiah thought of, brilliant prophet as he is. It was something that God provided. Micah, another prophet, uh, said basically the same thing. He affirmed, if you would. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God? In other words, God gives clear direction. God gives clear understanding. God does not desire that our salvation be a mystery, or be some esoteric learning that we need to do, but be a clear-cut path to knowing Him. And... Uh, God leaves no stone unturned. It is um, God's desire uh, for one and all to be saved, to be redeemed, and to know Him. Sometimes it's good, it's a good thing, to see the extent to which God has gone that we may know Him. God has gone to the extremes that we may know Him. This is how passionate God is about us knowing Him. The Lord Jesus Christ, God's own Son, gave of Himself that we might know Him, have our sins forgiven, and share eternity with Him, with one another, with God, for all time, forever. Make no mistake, salvation is a relationship that is provided by God's Son. It is a relationship with God and with one another. Forgiveness and love are available in Jesus Christ for the asking. You don't have to do anything other than just plain ask. God has provided everything else. God has done all that's necessary. God has made our Lord Jesus Christ the once and for all sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sin. That's it. It's, it's nothing that's complicated. It's all provided by God's own hand. According to the passage in Hebrews, these four verses, uh, God has seen to every detail of our salvation. Jesus is sacrificed. On the cross at Calvary is simply all we need for salvation once and for all. We receive this Jesus as our Savior by faith. And that is all we need. That's it. Once and for all. Sounds simple? Well, it is. It's what God intends, final and complete. I remember one time I saw kind of a documentary on, I think it was PBS, about um, different views of the Christian faith and different understandings. And uh, a um, agnostic or atheist was uh, being questioned. And she made a remark about the Bible I thought was interesting. 
she said that it was just um, well, beyond what she could really understand. How God could drop down a single volume that would have all the understanding we need about salvation, Christ, hope, uh, getting along with one another, all those things, among others. And what God has done. God has given us a single volume. Uh, easy to understand. Nothing complicated about it. 95% uh, of the Bible you can understand with no help whatsoever. In my opinion. And uh, that's important for us to know. That's important for us to know. This is not a mystery book. This is about our salvation, the eternal disposition of our soul. God does not make that complicated. God would never make that complicated. He desires for us to be in the kingdom of God with him forever. And has given his own son that we might do that. That's important for us to know. There's a I attended a Bible college in Florida several years ago, and one of my professors had a um, frame on his license plate on his car, and it simply said to seek God. And so the students one time in class uh, asked him what he had in mind uh, for that, uh, why, why he was having, why he had that um, frame on his license plate, seek God. And he said, well, if I just had seconds, and let's face it, in traffic, driving around, you get in the back of somebody, you move along, and you just have a seconds, maybe a few minutes, but basically, you know, traffic shifts back and forth, so you don't have, nobody's going to be looking at your uh, license plate for very long. And if you could say one thing to a person that would be important for them to know and understand beyond anything else, perhaps, my professor thought, it was seek God. Just seek God. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. That's uh, scripture. And I think within that context, seeking God, you'll find, by faith, our Lord Jesus Christ and His forgiving work on the cross at Calvary for your sins. And you will enjoy relationship with God forever. That's what this passage in Hebrews is about. That's what this church is about. That's what we need to have with God. Relationship. Relationship by faith through our Lord Jesus Christ. And relationship with one another. Born in the love that Jesus Christ our Lord has shown us. That's where we're at. Amen. Today's scripture is from Psalm 34, 1-10. I will sought the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people. For those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to him. Today we honor God and thank him for all the saints that he
he have sent us that have influenced our lives. We honor those who have gone before us. But make no mistake about this. In, in our faith, it is our belief that these people should not be prayed to. We, we don't pray to them. We don't pray to them because they cannot hear us from where, the, where they're at. They're in glory. They don't hear us. They cannot do anything to help us from where they're at. But they are in, in heaven. Now we should not hold any man or woman in such high regard that we bow down and we pray to them. We shouldn't do it when they are alive. We shouldn't do it, obviously, when they have left us. For we pray to one, the one who can hear us, the one who can rescue us. For you pray to God. And we only pray to God. But All Saints Day reminds us that we stand on the shoulders of those who are faithful, who have gone on before us. For we are a part of a great history. We are still one body. One body under God. We are in one body in the history that we call Christianity. One body under Christ. It is in God whom we give praise. He is the one who sent us those who have greatly influenced us, who have inspired us who we have looked up to, who has shown us love, who has shown us compassion. It is God who has sent these people to us. It is Him who we should give glory to. We have known and experienced the love of God through these folks we call saints. Glory to God. Now you may ask, you may ask, who, who could be a saint? In our faith, anyone who shows the love of Christ can be a saint. For the title, for the title of saint, we've, we've kind of reserved that for specific people, mostly biblical figures, pre-Reformation Christians, especially those who, who died in martyrs of faith. There are no rules in our faith who can be a saint. But for the most part, of course, we, we give the title to those folks. That doesn't mean in our lives somebody didn't live the life of a saint. Somebody that God put in our lives that inspired us. Somebody who loved us, that we, that we loved as well. But of course, had that special relationship with God. We have all had people we have looked up to in our lives as people that we've mentioned. I personally do not have one specific one, but I have many people who have influenced me, who have inspired me over the time of my life. They all seem to have a few things in common. For all of them have exalted the name of the Lord. They have praised the Lord at all times. The name of the Lord was always on their lips, even when they were sick. And in pain, you could hear their faith. You could hear them rejoice. They sought the Lord. The Lord always delivered them from their fears. Their faces were radiant. They never covered their faces in shame. They didn't have to. They always had that pleasant look in the eyes. You know what I'm talking about by that. You, you can look at somebody and you say they have trusting eyes. We'll find comfort in those eyes. That's because those eyes behind them is the love of God, the inspiration of God. These folks know it. And despite how much or how little they had in this world, they always seem content with what they had. And yet, even if they had a little, they never really seemed to lack anything. And why is that? Because, well, I think we all know why. 
It's because God delivered. The Lord always delivered. He delivered on everything they needed. Perhaps not everything they wanted. But everything they truly needed, they had, and they knew it. And these people that we respect so much, they took pride in doing work for God. They took pride in doing work to benefit his children. Whether it be serving on a board, whether it be cooking a meal for somebody, perhaps cooking a funeral meal, anything that was done for the children of the Lord, they took pride in doing. It. This was important work. And they gave glory to God. And at times God showed them kingdom. Now I'm not talking about that. When I say his kingdom, I'm talking about his glory. I'm talking about the light that shines through them. That you know that this, this is a person who has that relationship with God. This is a person who understands the will of God. This is a person that has been claimed by God because they have invited God into their life. We can see the glory of God in those eyes, through them, through their actions, the way they live, the way they love us. Now I said a few moments ago that there were not just one, but several people in my life that have influenced me and they all seemed to know the secret of happiness and that, that secret was not focusing on things in the world but on, on godly things those things don't, don't fade away but they all had traits they, they had these characteristic traits for the ones that I've already talked about they all seemed to have them now personalities of course could be different that's a human, it's a different. But some character traits, some of which we've already mentioned, they all had, for they all had loyalty. They were loyal. They were loyal to God. They were loyal to us. They all had joy in their lives. We already talked a little bit about that. They had a certain kind of happiness that was something beyond what the, could be offered in this world. And they all knew love. Loved us, loved their neighbors, loved God. They knew love. And speaking of love, when you love, what do you do for somebody you love? They sacrifice. All these people we're thinking of that we remember so well, so fondly, they were all sacrificed and they were all giving. The kind of person that we would say would, would give you the shirt off their back. They all knew self-control for it seemed like they always were even tempered. They always stayed even, never, never getting too angry, never getting too upset. Always staying even. And they all were inspiring in one way or another. Now these traits that we speak of, and many more, these traits are from God. Those who, who know God, those who love God, those who have allowed God into their, their lives exhibit these traits. And that's why we can rejoice for they are still part of us. Again, because we are one body under Christ. They are great examples to us. They have a, a special place of honor in our lives and they should. For these people we speak of, these people that know God, these people that showed us all these wonderful things, these people that inspired us, these people that we learned from, they are worthy to be remembered. For they, they are children of God as well. Still connected to us. And we honor them. We remember that. And when we 
you look back at your life, you can still learn from that. And give God the glory that you put them in our life. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the people that you've placed in our lives to inspire us, to love us, to show us the way, O Lord, to teach us your way. In one, one way or another, because there are many ways that Show us that love. There are many ways that they show how to, how to be in relationship with you. We thank you for them, O oh Lord. They've inspired us. We remember them. And of course, praise your name for it. In your name we pray. Amen. Today's scripture lesson is from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, 1 through 12. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Today is All Saints Day, and All Saints is about life and living and life and living like all saints has a simple theme, and it is this, now and then. Now listen closely to what I'm going to say about now and then. Now is not then, and then is not now. And you can't get now without being then. Did you notice in life that now is now, and then is then? Now is not then, and then is not now, and you can't get to now without being then. It's just also very confusing. When we were younger, we couldn't wait to go to school, but we couldn't go until we were five or six years old. And when you had older than brothers and sisters who went to school, you had to stay home. And that was always confusing. I'm ready to go now. Then we couldn't wait to get our driver's licenses because we wanted to drive now. But then we couldn't drive because that now we were not old enough. Then it was hurrying along to graduate, off to college or to work, then possibly marriage and babies. The point is, now is not then. 1 John 33, 2 tells us, Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. Growth and change are constant in our lives, and that's also true about ourselves. Our spiritual lives grow just like our bodies grow. The amazing thing is our spiritual lives continue to grow even though our bodies are done growing, and not only done growing, but actually growing weaker. But even in that weakness comes with getting older, there's something new. As we read scripture as a child, we see it one way. As we age and maybe read that same scripture at 20, we saw it another way. And after being married or having children, we read scripture and we see it another way. And in those fall and winter years of our lives, we read scripture a totally different way. Again, proving that God's word is alive and active. John wrote, what we are now 
is not what we will be. That's because God, who never changes, is constantly changing us to be more and more as he would have us to be. God continues to work in us every day. Every day, as we continue to age, he works in us. God has a plan for each of us, and he'll continue to work at us until we reach the goal that he has set for us. If we don't respond to that call, God's call, or specific goal each of us has, something will be lost. If we don't answer God's call for ourselves, who will? Who will reach that goal that God has set for us? And on again into then is not now, it's also true, then is not now. Revelation 7, 9. I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm, palm branches in their hands. That's right. We believe that life, as we now know, is not all there is to life. The time of this life is but a drop in the ocean of time and much more. That's eternity. In the Christian faith, we believe that death is another phase of living. A living in an existence that is completely and totally peaceful. I believe the word we could use is bliss. Just how good is it there? They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. Paul had this hope flaming in his heart and he said, I am convinced that the troubles of this life are not compared to the glory come. Imagine a place where there is no death, or sorrow, or pain, or tears. No warts, no birthmarks, no limps, no aching joints, or fading eyesight, or broken organs. Such a place does exist. And those who have died in Christ this past year are in that place. They are there, and we need not grieve for them, because there they wait for you and me. And someday we will join them, and there's only one way to get there. We must also remember the mark that each of those who have gone ahead of us has left in our life. Those saints who have gone before has left a mark that still continues on in this church and in each of our lives. Those who have gone ahead have shown us by example how to live our lives. At times, they encouraged us in our faith and prepared us for joys and sorrows that we continue to face each and every day. That grandfather or father that stood strong in his faith in times of trouble and adversity showed us the strength needed to pray, ask God for help, and then move forward one small step at a time. That mother or grandmother who prayed over her children daily shows us not only her love for her children, but her reliance on a God that is always present and always listening. He heard those prayers, and he knew the heart of those who pray. What are we doing to leave our mark in our families, in our church, and in our community? Are we following the lead of those who have gone before us? And if we aren't, just how are we supposed to accomplish that? How can we, by what we say or do, show others the way to God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? What is God mapping out for your journey on this earth? Don't be afraid of the call. God will give you exactly what you need 
when you need it, including the words and talents to reach out to others. Once again, you cannot get then without being now. That's what Jesus was getting at in Matthew 5, 1 through 12, who said, Blessed are, for they will. Do you see a pattern? There was this present tense, blessed are, at the beginning of each phrase, followed by a future tense, for they will. Jesus was telling us that life is hard now. Psalm 90, verse 10 says, Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. What is now is not will be what will be then. Let me say that again. What is now is not what will be then. It's hard now, but the good will be complete when we are in heaven. A cross now and a glory to come. No pain, no gain, said Vince Lombardi. No cross, no glory. When we look at the cross and lift high the cross, believing, we see the Savior in life who died and rose and lived on high for all to love and adore. And that being the case, when we live life in the shadow of the cross, even now, whatever now is delivered to you right now can be seen with all the blessings to come that will be then. As we look at the cross, we can be reminded of exactly what Jesus did for each of us. He was tortured for our sins and put to death, even though he was the only one who ever lived on earth that was without sin. Let us pray. Lord, we celebrate our God, who is able to do incredibly more than all we can ask or conceive by the Holy Spirit that worketh among us. He sees our now and he sees our then. And we see our now wondering what then will be. But when we put our hope in God and his Son Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, we can arrive then from where we are now. In all of these things, let us pray. Amen.